Hello and welcome everybody to a new broadcast or a new video from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today I have for you a video that is called The Greatest Trojan Horse of Them All. And of course, on the title you see already that this is dealing with Chapter 7 of the book Behind the Dictators by Leo Herbert Lehman that I'm reading for this moment. It took me some time and some patience to get my wonderful Christian friend over there in the United States of America, Tom Fress, to join me with this reading, as I have already done another reading, as you know, with um, Brett Norman. But uh, Tom is very eager to join me here today. He is very well prepared, as always. And I'm very glad to welcome Tom Fress after a long time of absence because of so much other work that he has to do to one of my broadcasts and this reading of the greatest Trojan horse of them all. Hello, Tom. Welcome. How are you doing? Oh, nice to be with you, Jörg, and your listeners, and uh, anxious to get into the book. Oh, absolutely, Tom. And uh, actually, <laughs> just the thought that comes up to my mind right now would have been wonderful to do the whole reading with you, except for this one chapter. But <laughs> that time, I'm, I, I think for the moment, is not granted to us to do that. So for that, I'm very thankful that you found the time to join me today in this reading of the greatest Trojan horse of them all. And as you know, by uh, doing the little preparation that you had time to do that on, you saw already that this is a wonderful chapter and as you made, made very clear in your stating that this is not only for Americans as a warning to be understood very important but also to people in Germany and even uh, let's say all of Europe as long yeah. as I hope they will understand English yes particularly Germany <clears throat> particularly how Germany has been used as a battle axe uh, for the antichrist of the Bible it's just an incredible revelation, and I hope your German listeners will pay particular attention uh, to this book and make some clear uh, decisions with regard to the history that's being revealed here in this book. Yeah, also that... And this, that was a war, this was a war against Germany, the seat of the Protestant Reformation. It was a war against the Bible and the God of the Bible and the people of Germany that read and understood and believed that Bible. It was a war against Protestantism and the Christ of Protestantism, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This was a counter-reformation, uh, a, 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 an ingeniously masterminded counter-reformation use of the very land, the heart of the Protestant Reformation, Germany. Yeah, I agree. And uh, on the title of this video, The Greatest Trojan Horse of Them All, you can also understand that it has to deal with the Jesuits, mm -hmm. who are the Trojan Horse of the Roman Catholic Church into all the world, right? Yeah, that's correct. They were founded as a military order, Regimini Militantis Ecclesiae, in 1540 by Pope Paul III, they were founded as a counter-reformation order of the papacy, and they are using so-called Trojan horse policy to infiltrate every one of their enemies, yeah. political, ecclesiastical, economically, whatever name you want to give it, whatever rises up against the papacy, the Jesuits will infiltrate and a Trojan horse stands for nothing else than infiltration when you know Greek history and how the Greeks introduced the Trojan horse into Troy at that time. That was infiltration, just on another level, right? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> are we going to start? Yes. Then I'm going to do the reading. And please, Tom, you know that I've prepared some comments. And whenever you feel to interrupt me because you have a comment of your own, then please feel free. So just say comment and I will shut up and okay. leave you the floor. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start reading The Greatest Trojan Horse of Them All, Chapter 7 of Behind the Dictators. And remind you, dear listener, this book has been published in 1942 in the height of the Second World War, the Counter-Reformation War of the Roman Catholic Church against liberal, prote liberal Protestantism all over Europe. A clever masquerade has always been characteristic of the political activities of Jesuit Catholicism. 
Jesuitry is a word in all our dictionaries that is defined as synonymous with subtle duplicity, indirection and disingenuousness. From Webster's 1828 dictionary we read that Jesuit is declared as one of the Society of Jesus, so-called founded by Ignatius Loyola, a society remarkable for their cunning and propagating their principles. That Jesuitism is explained at, as, listen very well, the arts, principles and practices of the Jesuits. Cunning, deceit, hypocrisy, prevarication, deceptive practices to effect a purpose. And Jesuitically is explained as being craftly. Are there some words that I've just read that you would combine? with the body of Christ? So when the Roman Catholic Church calls itself the only true church founded by Jesus Christ, and they start an order of the so-called Society of Jesus by Ignatius Loyola in 1540, and those are the explanations that you can give to that order, would you really think that this is from the God of the Bible? How about you, Tom? Probably the, Jesuits, the Jesuits are masters in the art of satanic subtlety and duplicity and lies. Even to the point of using the scripture to justify their ends. There's a... a, a uh, an identifying uh, philosophy within the, the Jesuit order that goes like this. The ends justify the means. And if in the Jesuit mind a global dictatorship by the papacy is a desirable end, then whatever means, fair or foul, can be used righteously to achieve it. And that's why the very definition of a Jesuitism is subtle duplicity, indirection, and disingenuousness. In other words, lying, a violation of what, one of the Ten Commandments of the Bible. There's no way that this church, the Roman Catholic Church, or the Jesuit order as a society supposedly Christian, even using the name of Jesus to describe itself, can be in any way Christian. It is anti-Christian, and it preys upon the religious uh, fervor of the people, both Protestant and Catholic, both Catholic and Protestant, rather, to achieve its ends. It hides beneath the cloak of the term Christianity, and those who are unable to discern righteousness from unrighteousness are easily drug in to uh, achieve the Jesuit goal. One of the greatest, we have to remember that the, Je, the Jesuit order, the Society of Jesus so-called, is, a, is a, an extreme minority in the world. And how can they achieve their goals in the world for a global dictatorship by the papacy if it cannot enlist, without its knowledge, Protestants? If it's limited only to those self-professing Roman Catholics to achieve its political and religious goals in the world, a global government for the Pope, if, if it could only use its own card-carrying Roman Catholics to achieve this, the sides would be clearly drawn, and they would be easily defeated. So the Jesuits have to accomplish their aims by recruiting, without their knowledge, Protestants to help support. And they later... Have and later when we read this chapter, Tom, sorry to interrupt you here, and later when we read this chapter, there comes a very fine example from Germany from the time of the Weimar Republic where they did That's exactly right. that. That's right. And so subtle duplicity and indirection and disingenuousness and lies are absolutely necessary for the success 
of the Jesuit order. And why must they relate to re, rely upon these satanic, <clears throat> anti-Christian uh, and, uh, means to achieve their ends? Because it's not Christianity to start with. And that's what Germany needs to realize. That's what all of Europe needs to realize. And that's what once Protestant America needs to realize. That's what all the, the Roman world Catholic has to Church realize. and the Jesuit order have nothing whatsoever to do with the God of the Bible. No. It is anti-God. It is a global attempt to replace the creator, God, with a human counterfeit. And who has any questions or doubts on that, what Tom just said, I can only turn them to my reading of Babylon Mystery Religion, the book from Ralph Woodrow that I read all chapters and everything of that is uploaded in, on my channel right now, that you can see that the roots of Catholicism, the roots of the Roman Catholic Church, are in Babylon. It all and that's why our Bible calls it Mystery Babylon the Great. Exactly. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That description fits no one else but the Roman Catholic Church. And one can one can research the possibilities for the rest of his life, and, and before long you become aware that there is no other candidate but the Roman Catholic Church. That's true. No one even comes close. No. So. Continue with the second sentence. <laughs> <laughs> when we interrupt every time after one sentence, we're still here tomorrow, but it's going to yeah. be a long video, but I don't mind because it's going to be fantastic. History is witness to the undeniable fact, continues the author, that the Jesuit order founded in 1540 for the express purpose of counter-reformation has excelled in the art of Machiavellian duplicity. Okay, let me Now, come. Let me come in first, Tom, please. Okay. <laughs> I okay. know that you prepared something, but I prepared something too. Yeah. This Machiavellian slogan is, quote, be suave in manner, aggressive in act, unquote. Actually, the Jesuits were not founded in 1540, but they were founded in 1534. Inigo, what is the real name of Ignatius of Loyola, and his companions followed an initiating ceremony in Paris, France, in two distinct places, in the St. Marie's Church at Montmartre and at the St. Denis patron saint of France in his chapel. And St. Denis, you have to understand, is, no other name, uh, is another name for Bacchus, and that is another name for Nimrod. On August the 15th in 1534, feast day of the Assumption of the Virgin into Heaven, so-called, the companions swore oath of service to the Blessed Virgin in St. Marie's Church at Montmartre and to St. Denis, patron of St. Franz, in his chapel. The experience of the Montmartre oath must have been intense for Francis Xavier, who was one of the co-founders of the Jesuit order with Ignatius of Loyola, who would become St. Francis, apostle of the East, made the spiritual exercises with a penitential fervor says Broderick in Origin of the Jesuits, that nearly cost him the use of his limbs. They vowed poverty, chastity, and to rescue Jerusalem from the Muslims. Where have we heard that before? Crusades, anyone? Well, however, should the rescue prove infeasible within a year, they vowed to undertake without question whatever other task the Pope might require of them. And this little comment is a quote from the book Rulers of Evil, that I read in completion on my channel, Chocolate 66, from page 45. But please, Tom, I know you're sitting on the tip of your chair, so please. <laughs> yes, come. well, this, this, what I have to say from now until I conclude is absolutely necessary for all of your listeners to understand. It is elemental, it is fundamental, And it is vitally important. If you want to know what the Jesuit order is all about, you first have to know what the Protestant Reformation was. And I, I, am, I am awed at the fact of just how many of those in the world who call themselves Protestant have no idea what the form of the word even means. It was a protest 
And what was it a protest of? First of all, before the Protestant Reformation, the Bible was illegal to be read by the common man. The Bible was, uh, was banned and burned, and even those who read the Bible were burned along with their Bibles. Why was the Bible so dangerous to society during the so-called Old World Order? That is because the Bible, once translated into the languages of the people so that everyone could read the Bible, made no, uh, no small effort to describe who the Antichrist is. The Bible is literally rife with descriptions of the papacy. And when the people read the Bible in their own languages for the first time, they came to the unanimous conclusion that the papacy is the antichrist of the Bible. It is the counterfeit Christ in the world. It takes the place of Christ on earth. And we know that Christ needs no help. We know Christ needs no vicar on earth. He rules and reigns through the hearts of his people. It is a spiritual world, a spiritual society. It has an ingrained uh law written on the on the fabric of its own heart and it is a society that will not be ruled by a man especially not such a sinful wicked organization as the papacy and so these protestants who were once roman catholic read the Bible for the first time in their own language, positively and unanimously identified the papacy, the leader of their own church, as the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist. And they came out of that church and then realized that even the governments of their land were controlled by the papacy. The papacy seated the kings. The papacy unseated the kings. The papacy ruled all over the kings of the earth. That was the old world order. And now that they put Christ on his rightful throne, they must dethrone the Antichrist. So they rebelled against their papal governments. They overthrew their papal governments and formed in their place Republican forms of government, those that put the people as the rulers. Since the, 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 the Holy Spirit dwells in each and every one of us, we don't need a man to rule over us. We have Christ to rule over us, and his law is written upon our hearts. And that was the power behind the Protestant Reformation, and that why, that's why it reformed all of Europe. And all of a sudden, we had a new world order, an anti-papal new world order. It was a, a biblically-based order. It was... For all intents and purposes, as imperfect as it was, it was a holy order. And the papacy was nearly destroyed because of it. Look, if the Pope complain, uh, 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 describes himself as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but nobody serves him anymore, then he's lost his title, hasn't he? He's lost his purpose for existence in the world. Now, Germany was the first country that overthrew that papal dictatorship, that antichrist dictatorship. It was Germany that read the Bible. It was Germany who unseated the Pope and put Jesus Christ on the rightful throne. And that the Roman Catholic Church determined to destroy, lock, stock, and barrel, every vestige of Protestantism in Germany and in Europe America and the whole world to restore the old world order where the Pope once again ruled over the kings of the earth. Now comes the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order's purpose, its stated, its stated aim and goal is to overthrow the Protestant Reformation, to unseat all popular forms of government, all Protestant forms of government, and to replace it with a global papal dictatorship. And they can use any means to achieve that end, fair or foul. Now you know that the papacy had a particular hatred for Germany, because Germany led the Protestant war against the Antichrist of the Bible. 
and Germany would be the the main stage for the final restoration of the of 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 the papal dictatorship and so the Jesuits went to work with their subtle duplicity, their indirection, their disingenuousness, and took a once Protestant land, put it under a fascist papal dictatorship, and used it to punish all of, it, of, of Europe that, that defected from the Roman Catholic Church and that put Christ on its rightful throne. And the Jesuit order is still at work today. It's work in Europe just as much as in America and the rest of the world. Their stated goal is to destroy the Protestant Reformation. And since the Protestant Reformation was, was literally founded upon the Bible, where after all, the Bible's the one that woke up the world to the fact, the indisputable fact that the papacy is the antichrist of the Bible, the counterfeit Christ. It is the Bible that must be destroyed. Once again, the Bible be made illegal to read, and if that's not possible, to corrupt all the Bibles so that no one can ever again, from the Bible, conclude that the papacy is the Antichrist. They have focused all of their efforts to destroy any notion, any inkling, any, any idea in anybody's mind that the Pope could be the Antichrist of the Bible. And that, in that effort alone, they have been supremely successful. And if we're going to fight off the Jesuit order, we must first understand what their goal and purpose is. And before we can understand what the goal and the purpose of the Jesuit order is, we must first understand what the Bible says and what the Protestant Reformation represented. The Jesuit order is the counter-reformation. Righteousness cannot reign in the world as long as there is a true Bible-believing Protestant in the world. And the Jesuit order is overthrowing Protestantism and all the Protestant governments and restoring a global dictatorship which, which takes its orders once again from the papacy, another old world order. That's what the new world order is. If you, they never defined what the New World Order is. It's just as simple as this. The New World Order is simply the Old World Order of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church restored on a global basis. And Germany is going to lead that counter-reformation. And it's going to do it through Adolf Hitler. And that's what this book is about. I, I'm sorry to have gone on so long, but one cannot glean the necessary information out of this book until he first understands what the Protestant Reformation was. It was a European recognition that the Pope is, the papacy rather, is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, that which deceiveth the whole world. That is a fact, a biblical, historical, and prophetic fact that cannot be successfully argued by anyone, no matter how articulate they are. The Protestant Reformation was a return to biblical Christianity. The Protestant Reformation was a return to Jesus Christ and him only. It was a return to the scriptures, and it revolutionized and, re and, and, and freed all of Europe. And the papacy with the help of the Jesuit order, the indispensable help of the Jesuit order, is restoring that old world order, and it's doing so only at the expense of the Protestant Reformation. It is Protestantism, the, the Bible, and Jesus Christ is what, is what the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic Church are against. And yet, the world believes they are both Christian organizations. And that's just how magnificent their deceptions are. Back to you, uh, Yerk. Yeah, as God said, I will send them a strong delusion. And uh, thank you very much, Tom, for that, even though it was long, but I think it was a very necessary journey into the explanation of the New World Order, Old World Order, Reformation, Counter-Reformation, everything that you just explained, very necessary. And... A little thought that came up into, my, into me here is 
the Bible also often speaks of the heart of man and how important the heart is. And we all know that this little muscle that pumps the blood through our bodies and uh, sustains us with life, <laughs> let's say that way, is a very important part of our body. And isn't it strange that out of the heart of the Roman Catholic Empire, the Roman Catholic, uh, the Holy Roman Empire of German nation, it was called, a thousand year right between 800 and almost 1800 for thousand years, out of that heart sprang the Reformation, sprang the Bible that Luther translated on the Wartburg in 1521 into the common, into the vulgar language of the people so that they could read it for themselves. And now the Roman Catholic Church is using that same heart, that same center of them, Germany, to force the Counter-Reformation all over the world. Okay, the book continues. It, still speaking about the Jesuit order, is an organization founded on military lines to fight for the political restoration of the Roman papacy and is the only order in the Catholic Church that binds its members by special oath for this purpose. Now, when you follow my channel a little bit, you already know that I made a three-hour video on that fourth row of induction of the Jesuit order, where everything in detail will be explained that Tom just, in 10 minutes or 15 minutes here, just summed up a little bit. And I hope and I pray to my Lord that there will be another chance that I can sit with Tom together in the future, although he also read the, uh, the fourth of induction online, to read it again online. But in the meantime, I will post the link to the video that I made, uh, I think, some two years ago in the description box of the video. And you can read the oath there for yourself and listen to my explanation that I gave in that video at that time. It, <clears throat> still the Jesuit order, uses the deep-seated religious needs of the human heart in order to carry out a plan which is patiently political and reactionary from the point of view of social matters. This is a fact that must be borne in mind today in order to understand what is behind the onslaughts of what is known as Nazi fascism against the liberal constitutions of protestant democratic countries. Present day, remind you, 1942, the writer speaks about, present day events appear as a mass of contradictions and confused paradox paradoxes which, if they are to be fully understood, require a most acute analysis. In order to uncover the real forces which are playing for high stakes in the game, it is not sufficient to examine the mere surface of things as they happen. It is necessary to discover who is pulling the strings from behind the scenes. From there, of course, derives the title of this book, Behind the Dictators the ones, the puppets on the strings they put in front of you, and you have to be able to see behind the curtain and see who pulls the strings. Because otherwise we reach not the real culprits, but only the puppets pushed out in front by their political masters to cover up and bear the brunt of the initial attack. Now, this is exactly what it is all about. The Jesuits are masters of disguise and hide behind all organizations they initially found. For example, the Bilderberger Group, founded by Knights of Malta. The same applies to the Council on Foreign Relations on the American side, and the United Nations, and numerous other organizations. They hide behind the worldwide banking system, control all of the media, and that means mainstream, social and alternative media, and control through all kinds of secret societies the governments of the world. If you want to go deeper into the control of the media, you have to read from the papal website itself the encyclical Inter Mirifica, where it is stated that it is the Roman Church's inherent right to own all media in the world. And that paper is from 1963, building up on another encyclical from 1957 called Miranda Prosos. Read them both and you will understand that this is not conspiracy theory, but that this is conspiracy fact, conspiracy of Satan against the body of Jesus Christ. I would, I would only add this, uh, Yerk. 
yeah. the the papacy has a papal bull, the name of you mentioned one and read the title of it and gave reference to your to, to you cited your reference a papal bull that gives the right of the Roman Catholic Church to own all the press. There's another papal bull that which is Roman Catholic canon law. All papal bulls are entered into the, the, the text of Roman Catholic canon law. It teaches that the papacy is the 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 only legitimate and sole teacher of children. And it makes the papacy and the papacy's teachings the basic element of every education system in the world. So so not only do they control the press and banking and uh, the secret societies and the official uh council on foreign relations and the other things that you 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 mentioned but they have to create a youthful society that is indoctrinated with their agenda and that's what the public school system is used to do this is how the papacy asserts itself into all the education systems of the world to prepare the young people of the world to accept their global agenda that's the very purpose of the public school system and doesn't it doesn't it doesn't hold true just for america but all the european nations as well you can't conquer the whole world unless you can solicit uh without their knowledge the youth of of the world and that's how they do it through the public education system Absolutely, Tom, and that is also something that I mentioned, and you too, because you read the same book online, an Inquisition update, Rulers of Evil, when we were speaking about <clears throat> learning against learning and marginalizing the Bible and taking the Bible out of the education system, which for the United States of America happened in 1963, when all of a sudden the morning prayer was abolished in all American schools. Today, in 2016, there are rooms made for Muslims that they can pray in school, but Christians, oh, God forbid. Just one little brief point to make sure everyone understands. Absolutely. A global youth that is trained and nurtured in the admonition of the nurture and the admonition of the Lord will never grow up to be papists. They will never accept the, the rule of a single man in the world unless he be Christ himself. And so that is the very reason. It is the, the, the Jesuit hand in education to remove the Bible. Just as they removed the Bible from the hands of the people in the old world order and burned all the Bibles and made them illegal to read, subject to the Inquisition, if you were caught reading a Bible, you were tortured and killed. Your property was, was confiscated. Your children were confiscated and put into orphanages, Roman Catholic nunneries and or orphanages. And your property was redistributed to those who were amenable to the, the old world order. You were regarded as a heretic if you were caught reading the Bible. And so, therefore, if, if the papacy doesn't want the United States to become a nation of Protestants, It absolutely must direct all of its efforts to controlling education, and first and foremost to remove the Bible from the from the from the from the school from the classroom. Absolutely, and, and remove and it from you know it's 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 <clears throat> it's allowable yet to read the Bible in the privacy of your own home and in your churches, but, but you're not allowed. Today, they are not allowed to. You're regarded as a religious fanatic if you believe in the Bible in the world today. Yeah, but, but still today, the Roman Catholic Church disencourages reading the Bible, and right. they say you cannot read the Bible because you are too dumb to understand it. It has to be explained to you by a Roman Catholic priest, if anything. So read the catechism. Yeah. And what did they do in the catechism, Tom? They stripped, completely they replaced stripped, the Bible with Roman Catholic teaching. They that is papal the second teaching. second commandment. Yep which goes like um, thou shalt not make thyself idols from anything or uh, idols or images from anything that is in heaven that is on earth or that is in the water under the earth thou shalt not bow thyself down to down to them and thou shalt not um, yeah um, and give, what is the greatest idol in the world <laughs> not just idols and images made by hands but a filthy disgusting <clears throat> sinful man yeah demon possessed 
who claims, ironically, to be the vicar of Christ on earth. Yeah, demon possessed Tom. That is a point that Alexander Hislop goes in in, in the summary of his book, Absolutely. The Two Babylons, where he says that the Pope actually is possessed by Satan. That's right. Who would dare? Anyone who is born of the Spirit of God, who would dare call himself the vicar of Christ on earth? Now you know who it is spoken of in the Scripture who said, who, who has eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking blasphemies. It's the papacy and no one else. It's only the papacy who dares to stand up in front of the world and use as his title, Vicar of Christ, which literally means replacement of Christ, which literally means Antichrist. Yeah. And uh, the world cannot remain oblivious to this fact. Certainly the Protestant reformers were not oblivious to the fact, and all of the world was reformed. And now the papacy is regaining all that it lost, and it's only because the people do not read and understand the scriptures anymore, the holy scriptures. And the Roman Catholic Church insists that the Holy Spirit is inaccessible, except you, li you receive it from the priest. They say that the Bible, you are too stupid to read and understand the Bible for yourself, which is just another way of saying The Holy Spirit cannot witness to you as you read the Scripture. This is directly contrary to what it teaches. He says, well, I must go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if he comes, he will teach you all things. So what is it if we are convinced that we need to dispense with this thing that will teach us all things and accept a man as our teacher. Have we not also blasphemed the Holy Spirit, just as does the papacy? If the papacy dares to stand up before the world and call itself the vicar of Christ, and that you can only understand the scriptures through the eyes and the mouth of the papacy and his priests, and if you believe that and act upon it, have you not also just as equally blasphemed the Holy Spirit as he has, as the papacy has? It's a blasphemous world. And unless we return to biblical Christianity, we will be slaves to this new world order. We need to put the Bible back where it belongs. We need to put Christ back on the throne. And we need to obey what the Holy Spirit reveals to us in the Scriptures and cast aside these black-robed Jesuits and priests who are nothing but representatives, global representatives of the man of sin in Rome. And until they do, Europe will continue to be vassals for the papacy. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> so, through by them controlled papal knight orders, them understand, uh, still explaining the Jesuit orders, the Jesuit order. They are in control of worldwide trade through globalization. In short, everything you can read in the book of Revelation chapter 18. They were founded as a military order with the papal bull Regimini Militanti Ecclesiae. And so through them the papacy is made king of kings and lord of lords instead of Jesus Christ. The Pope is just a mere puppet on the throne who will cease to live when not completely obedient to his master, the Black Pope. Even Pope Francis today in 2016, who is a Jesuit of the fourth vow himself, knows that he has to follow the orders given to him. And we can read for confirmation in the new book by P.D. Stewart, which is called Pope Francis, Lord of the World, or Surprising Revelations That Threaten Pope Francis' Reforms, as quoted. Quote, Will Francis be permitted the freedom to act contrary to the dictates of the Jesuit general? In speaking of Francis' limitations to eff effect true reforms, P.D. Stewart quotes the Jesuit-trained Count Campello, 
a once highly esteemed canon of St. Peter's Basilica and a great friend of one former Pope, who, when illustrating this fact, drew a circle and said, Within that circle he, the Pope, is free to act. If he crosses it, he is a dead man. Continue in the book. All the efforts so far made in America to fight the forces of fascism, Nazism and communism in order to safeguard the gains of liberalism and democracy have been frustrated by the fact that few have been aware that their chief strength lies in their ideology. Now, again, I have to make a comment here. Even bigger problem, even a bigger problem here that I do not think even the author understands is that the United States of America were founded by Jesuit educated Roman Catholics. And I speak here of the government of that country, not the poor souls fleeing papal persecution from Europe and thinking that through the promised freedom of religion, they would escape the wrath and persecution of the Antichrist in Europe. The English colonies had freedom of religion until 1776, when through the constitutional right of religious liberty, the Roman Catholics received this right too. Is there, or has there ever been, freedom of religion within the realms of Roman Catholicism? For a better understanding of what I tell you here, if you have any doubt of the correctness of my statement here, go to my book reading Rulers of Evil and many more lectures in the playlists Hour of the Truth and find confirmation of all I said here and do your own research. Many links provided and all my other work to confirm what I said here and even the Bible confirms my allegations in Revelation 13 when understood correctly. Quote, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And it had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword, and did live. Unquote. From the Bible. Now the author continues, Only now is it being slowly realized that they can never be overcome by fighting them merely along the lines of economic interests. But all that comes under the name of fascism will never be successfully met until it, is, uh, until it is further fully realized that the essential foundation of its ideological factors is rooted in the past. Americans will never win out against it unless and until they bring to light the activating forces set in motion long before Mussolini and Hitler for the express purpose of arresting and eventually destroying the progress that followed upon the Protestant Reformation and the American and French revolutions. Nazi fascism is not merely Kaiserism with bad manners. It is the spearhead of a hidden force which set out long ago to impose a new ideology upon the post-Reformation world. Religion and please keep in mind that religion is man-made belief and faith system. It has nothing to do with following the word of the one true God who speaks to us through his word, the Bible. And again I put emphasis on an uncorrupted Bible, the King James. You can take any Bible you want. I don't care. But the more you will study it, the more you will see that only the King James is the uncorrupted, preserved Word of God today in 2016 that we still can get. So, when you use any other Bible, put the King James next to it and compare it for yourself. I will not go further into that, but understand that religion is a term for man-made belief. And the belief in the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, is not religion. That is adhering to our maker, to our creator. Anyway, the author says, Religion, which has always been used by ambitious oppressors to serve the ends of their political power, is the mask to conceal their scheme of action. 
although religion is the most sacred of man's needs, it is the easiest and most effective cloak to hide a poisoned dagger from an enemy. It has always been used by political Catholicism as a Trojan horse, with all the appurtenances of war safely concealed within its flanks. This is especially the case in liberal democratic countries, like the United States of America, where a wealthy and powerful organization like the Church of Rome is safeguarded not only against open attack, but even against mild and just criticism. American tolerance. Hmm. Tolerance. There's another word that you can use. Compromise. American tolerance, leaning backwards, has forced a rigid policy of, on leading newspaper offices and bureaus of public information to treat the Church of Rome as a quote-unquote sacred cow. Just as the Trojans unexpectedly accepted the mysterious horse thrust within their gates by the wily Greeks, so too has America stood in awe of the sacred cow of Catholicism and has never dared even to question its presence. Well, isn't that the elephant in the room that you don't see? Yes, Tom. It certainly is. <laughs> Roman Catholicism, the great Trojan horse of the uh, infidel. And uh, the Protestants, who I disagree with the author, the Protestants who founded this country, under pressure, conceded to religious freedom in this country. Now, to most people, the term religious liberty is a laudable thing. But let me ask your listeners one question. All of you true Bible-believing Christians who know but that, that there is but one God, when he comes into his kingdom and we become his subjects, will there be religious liberty? Ask yourself that question over and over and over again until the answer becomes obvious. There's only one King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the universe, and it's not the papacy, nor is it Buddha, nor is it Confucius, nor is it Muhammad, or any other permutation of error. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and only to that God will we bend the knee. So the Protestants were overthrown on a mere concession to allow every permutation of error to have equal place with the God of the Bible. That's how America was overthrown, and it was overthrown at its founding. America was once majority Protestant, and it conceded to the Antichrist. Shall we succumb to any, more, any further pressure? Shall we repeat the mistakes of the past? Or we, shall we stand up firmly against the God of the Bible and firmly against the Antichrist of the Bible? Only then will there truly be righteousness to reign and freedom to reign in this country and the rest of the world. Roman Catholicism, that sacred cow, even though all of its priests are pedophiles, a global priest pandemic of pedophilia, the, the press must never dwell on it very long. And anybody who speaks out publicly against the natural inclination of an idolater one who worships a man and not the true God, one who worships images and idols and, and burns the Bible and those who read it, only they are the ones who are the sacred cow who against whom we cannot speak against. Has the world gone insane that we can't even criticize the ghastly reality that the Roman Catholic Church is led by pe pedophiles and that the, gover that the priests who lorded over all the, the Republican and Democratic 
politicians in Washington, D.C. are pedophiles. You see how we've been shamed into silence because there must be religious liberty in this country. We must repent of that form of liberalism and do as the Protestant reformers did. Return to biblical Christianity and stand up against the Antichrist of the Bible and all of his priests and all of his Roman Catholic canon law and all of his pedophiles and all of his governments and put Christ back on the throne. Back to you, Yerk. Americans are justly fearful of being accused of religious bigotry and intolerance since they have long prided themselves as guaranteeing religious liberty and freedom of expression to all corners, uh, to all comers. They have been thus without means to justify an open investigation of an organization suspected of concealing dynamite that, touched off by their other dangerous forces, may explode in their midst and destroy the very constitution that has enabled them to remain secure and prosperous themselves and tolerant to the Catholic Church itself. Marie-Joseph-Paul-Yves Roche-Gilbert du Motier, better known as the Marquis de Lafayette, stated prophetically, If the liberties of the American people are ever destroyed, they will fall by the hands of the Roman of the Romish clergy. Unquote. Observers in America's ivory towers have been blinded to the real facts behind the present upheaval that threatens to wipe out every vestige of post Reformation liberalism from the world. This is due in great part to that subtle duplicity which has enabled Jesuit Catholic forces to pave the way for and cooperate with. Nazi fascism's successful efforts to impose on the world an entirely new ideology, while at the same time making it appear in Protestant countries that, listen close, the Catholic Church is on the side of democracy, is in fact one of the main bulwarks of democracy. Its real aim and purpose, however, can be known only by an examination of its activities before and since the rise of fascism. The Jesuits take a solemn oath to fight a crusade for Catholic restoration. You know, we spoke about the oath of induction before. This is it. The success of which has always depended first on the complete destruction of Protestantism and its increasing liberalizing effects on political and social life for the past 400 years at that time, 500 even today. For it was Protestantism that undermined the political power of the papacy in the past. That's exactly what Tom, what Tom was stating the first 15 minutes of this video. It was Protestantism that undermined the political power of the papacy in the past. It made religion a matter of individual choice. It liberated the individual from the authoritarianism of kings and popes. It freed the civil state from ecclesiastical interference. It caused non-Catholic governments to deny outright the vital claim of the Church of Rome to be, by divine right, a universal, a independent entity and superior to all other forms of government. It took away from the Church of Rome direct control over all the institutions that go to make up the life of man, marriage, education, charitable, cultural and recreational activities. It is now accused by Catholic spokesmen as being the instigator of communism and atheism and the ally of world Jewry and Freemasonry. Now I, okay. have to go, I have to go a little back here to that last yes. sentence where I read a universal independent entity and superior to all forms of government. Well, when you want to know where that is stated in the Roman Catholic Church, then go and read the papal bull, Unam Sanctam by Antichrist Pope Boniface VIII of 1302, who stated that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. But please, Tom, 
I want to hear your comment on that. Well, yes, <clears throat> the author has just described how the old world order existed. The papacy ruled over the kings of the earth and controlled every facet of human endeavor, all government, all education, even the institution of marriage. And it was that, this idea, this Antichrist idea, that the Pope was, as it were, God on earth and had power, independent power, in irresponsible power. In other words, that the Pope was not responsible to any other thing. It stood alone and aloof in the world and the dictator of all human affairs and all human governments. That's what this author has just described. Read it again for yourself. That's what the old world order was. Now, if that was overthrown by the Protestant Reformation, if it was overthrown by the Bible, the King James Bible, and if it was overthrown by Christ and his people, then should we allow the old world order to reform itself? To once again rise to power in the world? Shall we allow the papacy to continue to erode Protestantism, which is just another word for true biblical Christianity? It's not religion. It's a way of life. It's a king and a kingdom and a law. The king is Christ. The kingdom is this world. And the law is his Bible. And all of the old world order could be described as the rule of Antichrist. The rule of the man of sin, the rule of the son of perdition, that which reigneth over the kings of the earth and deceiveth the whole world. Shall we allow that to continue to rebuild itself into the form of a global dictatorship under the guise of Christianity? Under the leadership of one who identifies himself as the black pope? We must come to our senses. We must come to our biblical senses. The whole world, not just Germany, not just America, the whole world. Listen, this man in Rome who calls himself the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the very vicar of Christ, that which says that the earth is mine and the fullness thereof and dictates over every aspect of the human endeavor who leads not only the kings of the earth but also the United Nations and the World Bank and Brussels, Belgium, the World Court. Do, do your listeners, your, do they realize that a charge was brought to the world court against the papacy for the global pedophile priest pandemic? And do you know what the world court said to those we bringing that have, litigation? We have no jurisdiction. We have no jurisdiction over the papacy. We cannot level a claim against the papacy. We cannot conduct a lawsuit against the papacy. The That's what the world court said. And the American people and the people of the world remain silent. Truly, the Jesuits have conquered any protest in the world for the man of sin and the son of perdition. The biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, we cannot bring a charge against the Pope or his priests. And the pedophilia continues. And it's covered up by the press. And pedophilia is only one small aspect of the criminality of that institution called the papacy. Yeah, yet because the world remains the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church is a sacred cow. You can't touch it. It's the apple of God's eye. You can't touch it. It's the leader of Christianity. What blasphemy! We all stand convicted of our own actions and inactions. And we must repent forthwith in sackcloth and ashes. And redeem ourselves to the Lord of Lords. We must restore true biblical Christianity. 
or we have no one to blame but ourselves for the reestablishment of the old world order. And they dare to call it new. Global criminality, global slavery, global fortitude, and a global war against Christ and his Bible. That's what the new world order is. It's led by the Jesuit order. It's led by the United States of America. The Counter-Reformation has proselytized and has, uh, has adopted the Roman Catholic Church as the very sword of the church. And we pay for it with our tax dollars and with our blood and with our guts. And, and with our spirit. To, and we do it with our eternal shame. How will any of us stand up before real King of Kings and Lord of Lords and give an account for our ignorance and apathy and blasphemy? I'm sure your listeners didn't sign in today to get a chastisement from some <laughs> little man in Iowa in the United States of America. But listen, is this not the voice of truth? I carry no responsibility for the truth. That comes from God alone. We're convicted of the scriptures. We're convicted of the Protestant reformers and all of those who gave their lives so that we could read and understand God's holy word for, their, for ourselves. We owe it to them. We owe it to them. Is it any reason the scripture said the righteous perish and none perceiveth it? All the martyrs of Jesus, we have spit in their faces by not standing up against Rome. We've made their blood nothing but water. How will we face the one who shed his own blood for us when we so disrespectful of the martyr, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Each and every one of us sit on, hang our heads in shame, repent in sackcloth and ashes, or stand up and fight for Christ and fight for the Bible and fight for law and order, God's law, God's order. The Bible says, God speaking, the earth is mine, and the fullness thereof. What right does the Pope of Rome have to govern us? And what right do the governments of the world have to take our tax dollars and use all the Jesuit priests and the Jesuit universities to write law that is nothing but Roman Catholic canon law under other cover? Under the cover of democracy? Under the cover of religion, under the cover of Christianity, God forbid. Let not another day lapse before the world takes account of its error and reverse its course and condemn the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in Rome as a counterfeit. You can't liberate Europe or Germany or the United States, or England, or the rest of the world until you comprehend who the real King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is and overthrow this usurper in Rome and rewrite the laws of this country. Rather, just burn all the laws of this country and replace it with a King James Bible. Then Christ will give us justice and plenty and liberty, and peace. No more war. We'll not learn war anymore under his rule. And until the Antichrist is overthrown, war will define our societies, all of them. Because it's only by war that Rome achieves her political and religious ends. Back to you, York. Thanks, Tom. So space permits only a very brief summary of the counter-reformation activities of Jesuit Catholicism, which led to the rise and present success of Nazi fascism against the liberalizing effects of the Protestant Reformation. 
But we are going to take today a lot of space in this little chapter to exalt on that, on, on that subject. The Thirty Years' War between 1618 and 1648, the murderous reign of the Duke of Alva in the Netherlands, the massacre of St. Bartholomew, and the bloody attempts at Catholic restoration in England, for which you have to read the Babington plot, and I will provide <clears throat> a link for that in the description box of the video, that you can inform yourself what the Babington plot was, and of course I advise you to go to First Amendment Radio and listen to Tom Fress's reading an Inquisition update of Rome and Civil Liberty by James Edgar Wiley, a book that he wrote in the 1860s and warning the then English people of the coming dark cloud, of the thunder clouds, of the thunderstorm of Roman Catholicism to take over Protestant England at that time. And Tom took a long time to read and explain that book. And when you listen to that, you will understand what the Catholic restoration in England really meant. So I'm going to repeat the sentence <laughs> because of that little explanation here. The Thirty Years' War, the murderous reign of the Duke of Alva in the Netherlands, the massacre of St. Bartholomew and the bloody attempts of the Catholic restoration in England are visible and terrifying examples of the anti-protestant activities of the Jesuit order in the past. It was they who instigated the Dreyfus affair as a means to overthrow the French Republic, and thus nullify the effects of the French revolutions of 1789 and 1848. For these, in the Jesuit view, were also the result of the Protestant Reformation. Now a quote from the Jesuit father Hammerstein. Quote, the revolutions of 1789 and 1848 were the result of the Reformation. And today we are faced with a choice of an alternative. Either to live in a socialism during these last years of heresy, meaning Protestantism, or to infect public life with the principles of Christianism, that is to say, Catholic principles. Hmm. You see, Christianism, Christianism is, in the words of the Jesuits, Catholic principles. Christianism has nothing to do with Catholicism. Anything else, says the Jesuit here, anything else is but half measure. End of quote. Now Hitler himself admits that he was helped by the methods of the Jesuit Counter-Reformation to carry on his ideological war. What war was Hitler fighting? An ideological war. Who ever told you that before, that his war was an ideological war? Wasn't it a war only against the Jews, so-called? Wasn't it a war as they tell you all, it's against Freemasons. No, it was an ideological war with the ideology of the Roman Catholic Church behind him, remind you. His use of brute force against all opposing convictions and philosophical, uh, philosophical opinions is the result of the fact, as he says, that, quote, I made a rigorous analysis of analogous cases which are to be met within history, especially in the domain of religion, unquote. Yes, Tom. So there was an admission, as clandestine as it may appear to some people, it's a plain statement. His war was an ideological war, and more specifically, a religious war. Now, he cloaked it in many other terms, but his war was against the Protestant Reformation. And any ideology that contradicted his little God in Rome. Hitler saw himself as a holy Roman emperor. He was recruited by the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. Hitler's parents were Roman Catholic. Hitler even early on started to, 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 to uh, study for the priesthood. His entire hierarchy were Roman Catholics. 
and he was led to his unquestionable, uh, unquestioning authority by priests in, 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 and future popes, as we'll read as we continue. He was literally brought to power by the Roman Catholic Church. And his war was against all those who opposed the Roman Catholic Church. Jews, Orthodox, they call themselves Christians, the Eastern Orthodox, and especially Protestants. And he waged that war in the very heartland of Protestantism, Germany. And that's the Jesuit hand. Even his SS was headed by a Jesuit-trained Himmler. And Adolf Hitler even admitted, we see in our Himmler, our Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. And he was even hailed after his death, his supposed death, by uh, uh, Franco, who lauded him as a son of the Roman Catholic Church. Here we have an admission by Adolf Hitler himself that his war was an ideological war, an ideological war based on religion, and that religion is nothing but Roman Catholicism. This is the truth you won't hear reported in the newspapers or in the, or the press. No one can touch that sacred cow in Rome, but history bears witness to the truth. Our consciences bear witness to the truth. The Counter-Reformation has taken on many forms and, and is still clandestine in the world today, and it takes an expert eye to detect it. It takes a biblical eye to detect it. It takes a leadership by the Holy Spirit of Almighty God to detect it. I pray each and every one of you have that discernment. It can only be achieved. It can only be uh, awarded to those who diligently study the Scriptures and history. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. <clears throat> but it was not until after World War I that the active plan for Catholic restoration began to take shape. Before the coming of Pope Pius XI in 1922, the Catholic Church had been forced into a more or less defensive position towards the liberal spirit of modern times. But with the election of its admittedly pro-Jesuit and pro-fascist Pope, Mussolini and Hitler also appeared on the scene, and in combination with them, the Catholic Church took the offensive. The following from the historical work of Karl Boker, an ardent supporter of the Catholic Restoration, is to the point. Quote, At this decisive moment, the Pope seized the reins and took into his hands the unified control of all fields of endeavor in which his predecessors had distinguished themselves. This was the beginning of Catholic action, of far-reaching importance, of the entrance of the Church into the fight, into the battle for moral and religious renovation, and for the reform of social institutions. And this intervention had for its end the destruction of the liberal spirit of the 19th century and the triumph of the Christian idea. Now, some, some explanation is necessary. Yes, I just wanted to add here... Um, this intervention had for its end the destruction of the liberal spirit of the 19th century. I just wanted to go into uh, Pope Pius's syllabus of errors, which you probably will mention right now, Tom. Certainly, uh, Pope wrote the syllabus of error of 1864, which literally condemned every non-papal government. And it did so under the term of liberalism. And note, most of these quotes, when they use the term liberal, is in reference to Protestant beliefs and social systems. It's an attack on Protestantism. And they use the term liberalism to describe it. I mean, after all, if you've departed from the, God, the divine authority of the Pope, after reading the Bible and coming to the realization that the Pope is the Antichrist and all the kings over which he rules serve the Antichrist, and you rebel against those governments and try to establish your, uh, a biblical-based Christianity rather than a Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic based Christianity. Well, you, you just described yourself as liberal. See? And so whenever we see the term liberalism used, it is a, it's a, it, it is an offhand reference 
directly to Protestantism. And so in the papacy's mind, if you do not adhere specifically to Roman Catholic canon law and the universal authority of the Pope, well, then you're liberal. You've departed from the truth. Yeah, but liberal, departed from the faith. liberal Tom also points to the liberals within the Roman Catholic Church because yes. there are a lot of clergy, there are even a lot of bishops who wanted to be, quote-unquote, liberal towards the Protestants and yes. wanted to live in peace with them. And this liberal movement within the Roman Catholic Church, and this is something that will be spoken of in other chapters of this book, but we can mention that here right now also, this liberalism is also fought by the Jesuit order within their own ranks, within the ranks of the Jesuits and within the ranks of the Roman Catholic Church. That's this correct. liberalism has to be rooted out because there is only place for fundamentalism. The when fundamentalism Hitler, of the Council of Trent policy, Tom. That's right. That they, the liberal Roman Catholic priests who wish to live in peace with their Protestant counterparts in Germany. And uh, America, for that sake. And America, uh, everywhere. There are those Roman Catholic priests who want to live in peace with their Protestant counterparts and uh, be a bit conciliatory toward their their uh, uh, opinions about the papacy, the Antichrist of the Bible. And before Rome elevated Hitler to power, knowing that Hitler was going to carry the sword, the battle axe for the Roman Catholic Church, and punish all of Europe for its liberalism, it first had to purge its own house. And that was the basis of what has commonly been referred to as the blood purge that took place before uh, Hitler really moved against uh, the Protestant Reformation. It had to clean up its own house. Those, those, those quote-unquote liberal priests who sought peace with the Protestants of Germany were killed. Yeah, and also the liberals within the NSDAP, the party of Hitler himself, with That's the right. Night of the Long Knives in 1934, killing off the SA, yeah. which was opposed to the SS. Just because like God did when he, when, when he brought his people to battle, uh, he, he said, sanctify yourselves. Well, the papacy did the same thing with her, her minions. They were sanctified. And those who did not, were not fit for battle, those who wanted peace with Protestantism, were done away with. Okay, that's a slaughter that took place in Germany that's hardly ever talked about. Rome killed her own people by the thousands and thousands, and priests were were uh, tortured and every other thing. And uh, so, so the hierarchy of this Nazi fascism became a staunch uh, followers of of the Council of Trent, and the Council of Trent was nothing but a global declaration that Rome was going to use whatever means at its disposal to destroy the Bible and Protestantism and to put the Pope as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in the world. It was an outright declaration of war against Protestantism. So these Roman Catholic priests became, uh, you know, uh, water in the mix. Enemies in their own ranks. Enemies yeah. in their own ranks. Many Rome viewed them as fifth columnists. Yeah. So they purged their own house. They killed all those priests and... Uh, and so there was a marked uh, return to the Council of Trent and the, the unique authority of the papacy over all of Christendom, so-called. And Hitler followed that same dictate, or it never would have been allowed to take place. Hitler and his regime did the purging of that Roman Catholic uh, institution that wanted peace with Protestantism. And so the, the battle lines were clearly drawn in the Roman Catholics. They saw what happened to their priests and those who were liberal toward Protestants. And so they became fervent Roman Catholics. And only then could they be useful for a, for a dictatorial fascist Roman Catholic Adolf Hitler, a Council of Trent Adolf Hitler. And only then could they successfully purge all of Europe of the Protestant sentiment, which they dare to call liberalism. Back to you. Okay, thank you. So continue in the book. 
Since then, we have witnessed Catholicism's open support for every step taken by Nazi fascism to impose authoritarian regimes upon all peoples. Its active cooperation in the systematic oppression exercised by the fascist regime in Italy itself. Its secret agreement with Hitler's National Socialism. The Vatican was the first to recognize Hitler's regime, by the way. Its support of Mussolini's shameful conquest of Ethiopia. And let me remind you, dear listener, here, in Ethiopia, where living, Bible-believing, Sabbath-keeping Christians. And even of Japan's invasion of China. Its open alliance with Franco and his rebellion against the Spanish Republic. Its joy at the annexation of Austria to Nazi Germany and the obliteration of democratic Czechoslovakia. Its part in the final triumph of Leon de Grel's Rexist party in Belgium and its fulsome praise of the French fascist state, which under good Marshal Pitain took the place of the defunct French Republic. Now, after Pearl Harbor, the Vatican accepted General Ken Harada as ambassador from Tokyo to the Holy See. I will provide two different Wikipedia links, uh, links that you can learn who General Ken Harada was. And General Ken Herada's superior was Paolo Marella. And he was clearly a Jesuit as he was a member of the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith, which is just the then used name for the Holy Inquisition. They changed the name to the Propagation of the Faith, the Sacred Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. And he by Paolo Merala, who was the superior of General Ken Herada, was a member of that. Links to your own research, as I said, will be provided in the description box of this video, that you can make up your own mind, and you don't even have to believe me or believe Tom. You can research for yourself. You have a comment brief, here, right? Yes, a brief comment. Notice, whenever the papacy wins in the battle... The first thing it requires its conquest to do is to establish an ambassadorship to the Holy See. And in other words, the nation is going to have to take into consideration, serious consideration, the papacy's authority over that nation. Once conquered by a Roman power, it becomes a Roman satellite nation. And it has to establish its ambassadorship with the papacy, and there's, there, thereby the communication officially and publicly takes place between that, that nation and the, the so-called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, Rome then binds that nation through concordat agreements, contractual agreements, that they will allow Roman Catholic curriculum to be taught in the schools, that uh, the, the civil laws of the land, by w whatever means necessary, uh, the civil laws of the land be conformed to Roman Catholic canon law and the Pope's authority be uh, accepted as universal and complete and unchallenged. And that the and Roman Catholic Church is the leading religion in that country. That's right. And Roman Catholicism becomes the, the official state-sanctioned religion. In other words, taxpayer-funded and that's the ultimate goal of the papacy. That how he, that's how he controls the governments of the world, and that's how he does it at our expense. When you pay your taxes, you pay for Rome to establish itself in this country. And whenever you go to war, you pay with your blood and your guts to establish Roman law. And so it's, 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 you know, the wars are couched in many different terms and never is it truly described what the purpose of the wars are. It is to conquer all nations that resist the universal and irresponsible authority of the papacy. You finance your own annihilation. You will finance your own inquisition. That's it. Okay, I'm going to continue in the book. Yes. For a moment, because I know a second comment is coming up. <laughs> the full account of events in Germany from 1918 till the rise of Hitler to power has yet to be written. In 1942, that is. But still, and this is why we do the broadcast today, there is much more than said in this book. So 
it still has to be written or it has to be said. But it cannot be denied that they were cleverly maneuvered to their outcome by the machinations of the Jesuit diplomacy. The owning classes whose liberalism was less an expression of ideal convictions than of material interests were gripped with the fear of the growth of socialism under the Weimar Republic. Well, let me ask you one question. What development do we see today in the United States of America? The owning, the owning classes whose liberalism was less an expression of ideal convictions than of material interests? What do you have in America? Everybody is only protecting his so-called own property, his own possessions, his own material interests. And those were gripped with the fear of the growth of socialism under the Weimar Republic. Well, that's exactly what you have today under Obama in the United States of America. Don't you see that he is absolutely forcing socialism on that so-called democratic republic over there? By Clever propaganda, the author continues, Roman Catholic forces succeeded in convincing them that an hierarchical church was their best protection against the attacks of the lower classes. Now, I want to ask Tom to make a comment here on how they did the same after World War II in the United States of America to quote-unquote protect the United States of America from communism. Because Tom, I know, elaborated yep. on that on several other broadcasts already, but I want him to make a comment here on that subject. Please well, talk. after World War II, the United States was enriched, and we became materialistic, <clears throat> and therefore, our, you know, the Bible plainly tells us where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so our treasure became personal possessions and not ideological truths. The Bible was replaced by good times. And so uh, now we are in the business of protecting our socialism, our material goods, and our social welfare state that provides security for us all, supposedly. And what we do, what we're doing is, is literally taking, letting, allowing Rome to distance us further and further and further from the only liberal, we, the only uh, freedom that we will ever enjoy, and that is Christ and his Bible. And uh, the great war of uh, democracy over, uh, over uh, communism is just a smokescreen. Yeah, isn't it it's that? busy work, if you'll allow me to permit. Uh, it's just busy work. It's just a cloak under which the continued aggression of the papacy to conquer all the nations of the world takes place. Wasn't that the policy in the United States of America after the Second World War that they said to the American people, if you're not a Catholic, you are a communist? That's right. I mean, that's the point that I wanted you to address, because I know yeah. that you addressed that before. I think it was in... Um, the global Vatican that you spoke about that, how they used the Protestants at that time to come over to the camp of the Roman Catholics because yeah. Roman Catholics were opposed to communism. And if you were not a Roman Catholic outward, you were a communist inward. Sure. And of course, anyone who's doing the research knows that, uh, that the, the uh, communist regimes were established by Jesuit trained uh, uh, Stalin and, uh, and Lenin. all the big names of, of, of Russia, after the czars were overthrown, they were replaced by consecutive Jesuit-trained priests. Lenin and Trotsky were Lenin also Lenin and Jesuit Trotsky then. and, and, and uh, <clears throat> all of them. And uh, it, it just, uh, we were, we were they, the, the pr with the help of the press, which the Roman Catholic Church controls, they so demonized Catholicism as godless and on and on and on. And, and then... They could manipulate uh, Americans into uh, uh, joining the Roman Catholic Church by just simply saying uh, that if you're not Roman Catholic, you must be communist. And so uh, the Roman Catholic Church grew by leaps and bounds, or at least so they claim. And But the war, the war, the real war that we should be fighting is for Christ and against Antichrist. And if, and if Rome can get us all engrossed in a, a, a proposed or a, an imagined threat, one that she has even created, I mean, after all, as we just said, 
Lenin and Trotsky and all those were, were Jesuits. The boogeyman was, was, uh, was a communism and not the Roman Catholic Church. And so that's just all part of the process of the, uh, the counter reformation to divert our attentions to a made up, uh, created boogeyman so as to protect the very Pope that's orchestrating the whole thing. In other words, we just read in, a, in an earlier portion of this chapter not to focus too much attention on what appears, el, uh, what appears evident. Yeah, on the puppets that appear in the front. deeper into the strings that are being pulled yeah. and who it is that's pulling the strings. Mm-hmm. We, the, we, those of us who are doing our research understand that the papacy is what created communism. The papacy is what created uh, fascism and, uh, and Hitler and hit, and the papacy is what created democracy. And all of these apparent opposed uh, systems through that opposition and through the conflict and through the wars, which cost us dearly in terms of dollars and treasure and lives with each stroke of, of the battle the papacy achieves a greater purpose, and that is to strengthen the papacy's position in the world as the arbiter of peace. She creates the wars, the apparent oppositions, the apparent conflicts, the apparent, the apparent threats, and then benefits by all conflicts in putting herself out as the, 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 uh, the, the, the divine right king of the world. And the great peacemaker, trying as much as possible to appear to be Christ on the earth. I know this must be, to most listeners, an oversimplification of the facts. But like we said, you can't get muddled down in the details and understand the broad picture. Rome has hidden the forest for the trees. Okay? And we see the Jesuit hand. We see the Jesuit hand in all of these conflicts. Rome creates the problem, and then uh, wearies the world with war and expense and debt, and then puts itself up as the peacemaker and the the legitimate government of the world. And it's worked marvelously. The people follow the Pied Piper, and never question their political leaders. And if they do question them, it's on irrelevant, irrelevant matters. Yeah, the people always talk about the Hegelian dialectic of thesis, yeah. antithesis, and synthesis, and never understand that the Roman Catholic Church holds the strings of the thesis, the antithesis, and of course then presents the synthesis, which was their plan from the beginning. The growth of socialism, the growth of fascism, the growth of communism, the growth of democracy are necessary elements in the papacy's conquest of the world. Yeah, to keep the grandfather's <coughs> clock going, eh? Yes, I, I was just simply going to use this <laughs> with my old standby description. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's Democratic or Republican or, or uh, any other form of government, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. It's always left and right, and whenever the pendulum of the grandfather clock, and by the way, they don't call it a grandfather clock for nothing. Each grandfather clock is a visible representation of what really goes on in the world. I know, Tom, there's a very fine video of you explaining the grandfather clock <laughs> principle on my channel Indeed. that's uploaded that everybody can have a look at it to understand no, the principle. <laughs> that's right. It was no... It was no coincidence that someone described that giant clock as a grandfather clock. And all political machinations, left and right, no matter what name they go by, here in the United States, it's Republicans and Democrats, they swing the pendulum. Left and right. There has to be that conflict. It is the dynamo that drives the Pope's new world order. If that pendulum ever stops swinging, once to the left, then to the right, the hands of Father Time, the grandfather of the world, cease to advance. 
So you can take socialism, you can take fascism, communism, all of them, democracy, throw them all in the same. They're just the engine that drives that papal pendulum left and right. <clears throat> and, of course, the hands on the grandfather clock always continue in the same direction, no matter which way the pendulum swings. Is this truly an oversimplification, or does this open the eyes of your listeners to how useless to themselves and how useful to the papacy is the entire global political system? Well, it's just a means to a religious end, a, re, a means to a papal conquest of the world. And I'm going, to, I'm going to say it. If you can describe yourself as either liberal or conservative, left or right, democratic or republican, no matter what political persuasion you are, if you can describe yourself in those terms, You've just admitted to the whole world and even to yourself that you are completely deceived. Now, I've probably offended all of your audience. <laughs> but we cannot come to the knowledge of the truth until we expose the real means that achieve the desired end of the Jesuits' and the Roman Catholic Church. It's politics. It's been said over and over and over again, you cannot understand the Roman Catholic Church until you understand that it is first and foremost a political society cloaking itself in the name of religion, and worst of all, usurping the name of Christ. Of course, there is a reason why the Pope wears the title of Pontifex Maximus, the title right. of the Roman Caesars. And wasn't it Pope Pius IX in his discourse who said the Caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone obedience and fidelity is due? That's right. That's an admission in plain black and white English. He the declared point. himself the Caesar of the world. The point you were making earlier, Tom, Is it really that simple? Huh. Well, that's, that's the beauty of the truth. The truth is simple. The lie is complicated. That's right. And that's why the people have to study for years and years and years in this damnable system to get so-called educated yeah. because it is so difficult to hold up the lie against the simple truth. That's right. Let me address your listeners personally. Please. On a one-to-one -one basis, I'm speaking to every one of you. Doesn't the truth have a certain ring that puts your conscience and your mind at ease? Now I understand. But the lies, the 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 cloak and dagger stuff is so confusing and you spend all of your life digging through every piece of junk and you dive down every rabbit hole and you think you're getting somewhere but still there's that little voice that says something's missing but when somebody utters the truth it just has a certain ring You've heard the truth. That's why you hear that certain ring. No, the only thing you have to do is to stand up to that bell yes. as you hear ringing. That's right. Christ didn't make it difficult for us. He's not in the business of deceiving his own people. He spoke in clear terms and put it in writing so that every generation could read it. And so that when we look at the complex, perplexing confusion in the world, we have but a simple truth. That's how valuable your Bible is. The Bible makes it such that no one can, no one can deceive you anymore. 
But we have to return to that Bible and the Protestant understanding of that Bible, the Holy Spirit-led understanding of that Bible. And then all of a sudden, we can neither describe ourselves as liberal or conservative, but Christian, truly Christian. And all of a sudden, the kings of this world and the governments of this world become the kingdoms of our Christ. A kingdom that will never end. And the governments of this world will serve him and him only. No religious liberty. And truth and justice and peace will finally reign in the world. It's up to us. <clears throat> but we must expose all of these lies and all of these liars of whatever political persuasion they are and renounce them as tools of Antichrist. And until we come with a holy fortitude to do it, we remain their slaves. You know, no one can rule over us unless we submit to their authority. And if they have no divine right, to rule over us, then we must seek the rule of divinity itself. The papacy has no divine right to rule over anyone, and neither do the kings of the earth who get their power and authority from him. That's the seeds for returning to obedience in Christ. It's not rebellion. They are the rebellion. They are the ones who are in rebellion against the lawful authority in this universe. We need to stop looking at ourselves as rebels. Start looking at ourselves as saints and inheritors of this earth. Then, right makes might. Right makes might. In their world, might makes right. In the kingdom of heaven, it is right that makes might. And that certain truth that you've just heard ringing in your soul, makes you right and therefore gives you the might to move mountains just as it is said of us in the scriptures even greater endeavors will you do than these when you say to that mountain move thee hence it will disappear before your eyes and what do those mountains represent the governments of the world That's our destiny as God-fearing, Bible-believing Christians and not to be subjects to sinful men who seek their own power and influence in the world and try to elevate Satan and his vicar in Rome as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You've just heard another bell ring deep down inside your soul, haven't you? No more rabbit holes for you. No more thrashing through junk and complexity and confusion. You now know a simple truth. Put flesh and bones upon the kingdom of Christ in this world. The Protestant Reformation put flesh and bones upon the kingdom of Christ. It exposed the the false teacher in the world, the false Christ. We can do it again. We can do it once and for all. With Christ's help, in Jesus' name, that's our destiny. Back to you, Yerk. I'm a little bit speechless. <laughs> I'm so glad I invited you to do this uh, chapter of this book with me, Tom. 
But uh, even in my wildest dreams, I couldn't imagine that we were going that deep into all that stuff. And I just love it. And thank you very much for your contribution here. Still, we have a few pages to go on, and I will see later if I can maybe cut this broadcast into two parts that people can keep concentrating. But for the moment, it is still one, and I will back up the last sentence for continuation's sake. By clever propaganda, Roman Catholic forces succeeded in convincing them that a hierarchical church was their best protection against the attacks of the lower classes. On the other hand, they used the anti-liberalism of German socialists to prove to these latter that political Catholicism and the socialist movement, both opponents of this liberalism, could form a solid basis for common action in the domain of political action. I'm very sorry, Tom, that you exhorted yourself that much with the comment just before, but I know that you want to make a comment on this sentence, because in preparation you were eager to explain to me what this actually means. So I'm going to read it again, let you take a deep breath, and then you can come in. On the other hand, the author says, they used the anti-liberalism of German socialists to prove to these latter that political Catholicism and the socialist movement, both opponents of, on this liberalism, could form a solid basis for common action in the domain of political action. The coalition between the Social Democrats and the Catholic Center Party was the result of this maneuver. In reality, it was an unconscious submission of the former, meaning the Social Democrats, to Jesuit Catholicism, which was just in, thus enabled to use Catholic democratic politicians and the anti-Jesuits for their own ends. So this means that by infiltration and making their policies seem to be anti-Catholic, they got even the votes of the Social Democrats, and they needed these votes to reach power in Germany. It was so cleverly done that the real aim of the Jesuits was not realized until Pope Pius XI, Antichrist Pius XI, dissolved the Catholic Center Party and thus left the way clear for Hitler's rise to power. In all this, Hitler had the cooperation of Monsignor Kahrs, the real head of the Catholic Center Party. The role played by former Chancellor Brüning, we are talking here about Heinrich Aloysius Maria Elisabeth Brüning, who lived between November 1885 and March 1917, 70, was a German Center Party politician and academic, who served as Chancellor of Germany during the Weimar Republic from 1930 to 1932. Meaning, they needed this republic in the meantime between the end of World War I and the outbreak of World War II to bring Hitler to power. The role played by former Chancellor Brüning, the political leader of the party, is as obscure as that of his ill-fated colleague Schosnick. The present Pope, Antichrist Pius XII, Hitler's Pope, was papal nuncio in Bavaria at that time and was well known to have been an enemy of the German Republic. After Hitler came to power, he was sent as nuncio to Berlin and immediately drew up a concordat between Hitler and Antichrist Pope Pius XI. Hitler rose to power in March 1933 and on the 20th of July of that same year, the concordat between Hitler and the Vatican was signed. That concordat is still in working today. Shrewd Franz von Papen, a favorite protégé of the Jesuits and a knight of Malta, as you have already learned, also played an important part in preparing the way for Hitler's final victory over the Social Democrats and all other parties in the Reichstag. And if we look closely into present happenings in our own Western Hemisphere, we cannot fail to note a cautious yet aggressive pro-fascist and anti-liberal trend in all official Catholic utterances. American democracy's greatest danger is fascist penetration of the Latin American republics, whose way of life has always been controlled by the 
Church of Rome. Now when you think about this, this last sentence are almost prophetic words when you look into immigrant situation of the United States of America today in 2016. So let me read it again. American democracy's greatest danger is fascist penetration of the Latin American republics whose way of life has always been controlled by the Church of Rome. Why do you think it is called Latin America? Huh? It's because it always has been controlled through Spaniards and Portuguese, the most Catholic countries in Europe. And that heritage leave all these countries in Southern or Latin America to be completely ruled by the Roman Catholic Church. So now when they use these immigrants yeah, to come into the United States of America, what do they import? Catholics, that's right. And they are only there for one goal, to support the Vatican fascist futurist plans. This is why I think these are almost prophetic words from Leo Herbert Lehman in this book. Evidences are plentiful that this Nazi fascist penetration has the support of the Catholic Church. The Catholic press in the United States ridiculed and openly resented the attempt of the United States to, quote, impose its will, unquote, on the Pan-American Conference held at Havana in 1942 to counteract Nazi fascist efforts in South American countries. The close observer will not fail to note the pronounced anti-Semitic, anti-Masonic, anti-British but pro-fascist tone of official Catholic periodicals and newspapers. Well, the author says here, the Catholic press in the United States. And you know, when listening to my other videos, that I refer to Miranda Prosos and Intermirifica, meaning nothing else but that the Roman Catholic Church says that it is her inherent right to own all media, newspaper, movies, radio, of course now internet because the papers I'm speaking of are from 1957 and 1963 when internet was not in existence. So of course the Catholic press in the United States was there, controlled the press of the United States was controlled by Roman Catholics. They are all over the world controlled by Roman Catholics. And they ridiculed and openly resented the attempt of the United States to impose its will on the Pan-American Conference held at Havana in 1942, because America at that moment was still considered liberal. Anyway, they also poo-pooed any need of compulsory military training in this country and instructed the Catholic people to write to their senators and representatives in Washington to protest against the efforts to pass the burke wadsworth Bill. Now, for the ones who do not know what is the burke wadsworth Bill, that is the, uh, the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940, also known as the burke wadsworth Act. <coughs> and that was enacted in September, uh, on September 16, 1940. This Selective Service Act required that men between the ages of 21 and 35 register with local draft boards. Later, when the US entered World War II, all men aged 18 to 45 were made subject to military service, and all men aged 18 to 65 were required to register. And I will provide a link on Wikipedia that you can study on the Burke Wetsworth Bill, what that was actually all about. I gave you a little summary, but nevertheless, always do your own research. They accuse the Jews and the Masons and liberal organizations of being the real fifth columnist, against whom Mr. Hoover, we are talking here about J. Edgar Hoover, who was self, himself a high Freemason of 32nd or 33rd degree. And for that also I will provide some links that you can read about that. So that 
against whom Mr. Hoover and his FBI should take action. And for confirmation of these facts, see the issues of the Jesuit magazine America, from uh, the Brooklyn Catholic Tablet, Social Justice, from 1940 and 1941. Montreal's Catholic mayor, Hode, in 1940 openly defined Canada's law requiring national registration for home defense and urged the citizens of Canada's largest city to disobey the law. Political ecclesiasticism which thus makes use of man's need of religion to serve its thirst for power, forfeits the right to be called religious. This is the last sentence of this chapter, and I read it again, that you can understand it, I hope, very well. Political ecclesiasticism, which thus makes use of man's need of religion to serve its thirst for power, forfeits the right to be called religious religious. So I'm very sorry that we had the technical problems that prevented Tom Fress to stay until the end and more than that that prevented me to upload the second part. We did I think an hour and a half on this part that I now took 10 minutes for because Tom was explaining very very interesting stuff but I can understand that he cannot take the time again to come on the broadcast again and repeat all that. That was a technical failure, which I hope will never ever occur again. But on the other hand, you know, we don't have it all in our hands. We depend on technique and free technique because we don't have any money to buy, to, to, to buy expensive stuff or even make phone calls, which are probably more safe than Skype <laughs> and uh, yeah the system broke down so I leave you with a little thoughts of this of this very important chapter the greatest Trojan horse of them all I hope you enjoyed as much listening and watching this video as much as I did recording it together with Tom and putting the video together and uh, again I'm sorry that I had to finish that all by myself but as I told the, or you already, this is the last chapter of the book that I'm recording. Everything else is done. And it has been almost two hours. So I know it is very long. But if you cannot watch it in one part, then please put it on pause or bookmark it and, uh, bookmark it and watch it another day. The rest, it is very, very important that you get this. And with this, I'll leave you for tonight. And uh, of course, this was chapter 7. So next time you can watch out for chapter 8 to come, which is called Nazi Socialism and Catholic Restoration. Until next time, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you, signing off, and bye-bye. <laughs>